My name is Rachel Spence. I'm the public programs developer here at the Museum of History and Industry, uh, which is my background. <laughs> um, and I am a white woman. I've got pale skin with freckles, brown eyes. I've got curly red hair. Um, my background image is a picture of the beautiful blue and white armory Mohai is in on a bright sunny day. And I'm very happy to uh, welcome you to History Cafe today. We're going to be looking at Filipino American labor activism in the fields and canneries. And History Cafe is a long running series uh, that we're so happy to get to do with our partners from History Link. And it's the third Wednesday of every month. We'll put a link in the chat uh, to the series, um, uh, the, the link for where you can find more about the series, but uh, look for it on the website every, when, every third Wednesday. And we'll also put a link for History Link so you can learn more. Jennifer, you want to say anything? Sure. I'll just say hello. I'm Jennifer Ott from History Link, and I'm also a white woman, but with long, straight blonde hair. And I'm in my home office uh, with a wonderful light field window behind me. And um, I'm, I'll am i be ducking off of the cameras shortly, but I just wanted to say welcome and so happy you're here. And this is one of my favorite things that we do. So uh, thank you to Mohai and Rachel and Nicole for helping me, us put this on. Have yeah. fun tonight. Thank you, Jennifer and History Link. We love this partnership. So, always happy to do it. So for those of you who are just joining us or have been hanging out with us for a bit, welcome to our Zoom room. I will give you some directions. Uh, at the bottom of the toolbar, you should be able to turn on and off closed captions if you would like to have that. Um, also note that we have a Q&A box. We ask that you put uh, your questions in there and then we're going to, after uh, speakers are finished, we will be doing uh, question and answer. And then we also have the chat as people have been putting some things in there. We love to hear from you. If you wanna add comments, if you have resources, if you have anything you wanna share, please put it in the, in the chat box. Make sure that you pick all panelists and attendees and then everyone can see what you say. Um, if you have any questions or are having trouble um, getting in or if you get off the call and need help, please email us at programs at mohai.org. Also, we will be recording this event tonight. Um, so if you know someone who wasn't able to make it, we'll let them know that they can go see it on our YouTube. We will be sending you the link afterwards. Um, and uh, the program, it's gonna last a little over an hour. And just so you know, all attendees are muted, but again, use the chat box to talk to us. Um, and then my uh, wonderful colleague, Nicole Robert, will be behind the scenes responding to email and chat. So we look forward to the day we can see you all, but we still love interacting. Please, please talk to us in the chat and share your thoughts. Before we begin the program tonight, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that wherever you are Zooming in from, you are on Indigenous land. Here um, at Mohai in Seattle, we're on the contemporary and historic lands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, and all Coast Salish people. We acknowledge the forced displacement of Native communities from this land, while also honoring the endurance of the Duwamish people who still live here. To this day, the Duwamish people have yet to receive federal recognition. And we encourage you to visit their website to learn more, and when it's safe to do so, to visit the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center over in West Seattle. If you're zooming in from a different part of the country, we'll also put a link in the chat where you can learn more about whose indigenous lands you are on currently. I also wanna note that this program is taking place in a time of ongoing protests against police violence towards black people. As we see these patterns of violence repeat themselves, these protests in our community and across the nation are a call to action for each of us to state unequivocally that black lives matter and Mohai stands unfalteringly with those who are calling for justice now. Additionally, we want to acknowledge the recent shootings that have highlighted anti-Asian violence in our country. Mohai condemns acts that promote inequity or acts that disenfranchise or marginalize people and stands firmly on the side of inclusion, equity, and cultural empathy. As a history museum, we have the rich resource of the past to guide us to help understand our present. By examining history together, we can learn from where we have been and also imagine a better future. 
And tonight we're going to be doing that by learning about the challenges and successes faced by local Filipino labor organizers. So with that, I'm happy to introduce our wonderful speakers for tonight, Richard Gertiza and Ray Pasqua. Oh, please come join us and uh, all of you in the audience, give them a virtual round of applause. And so we're going to be starting uh, with Richard Gertiza, who was born in Yakima, Washington and earned his BA MPA at the University of Washington. Um, he is the current member of the visiting committee at the UW Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies. He's a retired director of the U IBU Region 37 ILWU Local 37 and past president of the Filipino American Political Action Group of Washington. We are so happy to have you here. And I'm going to, uh, as it were, pass over the mic. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Can anybody, uh, can you folks hear me? Okay. We can hear you. We can hear you. You sound okay. good. I just, I don't see myself here uh, on my video screen. So I don't know you, whether. You look great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. Well, maybe that's a good, maybe that's a good thing because I can't see myself and I'll just talk. So I don't know what I, what's going on here. But anyway, uh, let me just, uh, first of all, I guess I need to describe myself. My name is uh, Richard Gertiza. I'm the uh, former regional director of the County Workers Union, IBU, ILW, Region 37. Uh, I'm of Filipino ancestry, and uh, I am currently wearing a union t-shirt, which has the union logo on. I don't know whether you can see it or not. I'll get in front of the camera. And it does say the union motto on the bottom, an injury to one is an injury to all. It's a uh, blue background with, uh, with uh, yellow lettering on it and borders. And so on the outside, I don't think you can see it. It says organized uh, since 1933. So uh, that's, I'm talking to you from my office here at home. Probably, uh, hopefully you got to get enough lighting, but, uh, but uh, I will do my best to uh, try to maintain, uh, I, since I don't have video that uh, hopefully I can, I'm in, you guys let me know if, I, if you can't see me, but I'll you know, try to stay in front of the camera. <clears throat> First of all, just to get started, I just would like to dedicate my comments to a friend of mine who recently passed away, uh, Arsenio Chris Election. He was a fellow Alaskaro who recently passed away he was a son of my first foreman in Alaska, our senior election senior, back in 1977 when I worked in uh, with Ward's Cove in Ketchikan. And uh, Chris uh, passed away suddenly, but he was a great uh, comrade and a great friend. <clears throat> so also I'd like to thank Mohai for providing this opportunity for myself and Ray to uh, talk about our story and our experiences within the different uh, labor and agricultural industries. Uh, first, I would like to talk a little bit about my personal history, a little bit more to elaborate on what it, where I came from and the, 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 uh, the image that you see there is me on the Edmunds Pettus Bridge. And I know some of you may be familiar with that. That's in Selma, Alabama, where my wife and I were fortunate to be there on the 50th anniversary in uh, 2015, we marched across that bridge. We didn't do it exactly at the time when they had the big celebration. We did it later in September, but it was, uh, it was quite a, a powerful experience to be there during that period. As uh, Rachel mentioned, I grew up on, uh, on, the, uh, on the reservation in the Yakima Valley. We had a 160 acre farm and uh, you know it was pretty, difficult and hard work growing up on a farm, but it was uh, something that I don't regret. And also because, you know, I, I, you know, going up to Alaska and working under those conditions made it much easier for me to, uh, to do the work because I was used to the type of work, working in the fields and 
working in the canneries was nothing compared to what it was bucking hay and doing the work on a farm. And, uh, you know, certainly allowed me and can, uh, allowed me to have that work ethic that, uh, you know, that I cling to today or to this day. You know, because I worked on a farm, there runs, runs a lot of parallels to what happened that the other people that were uh, workers that were recruited down the San Joaquin Valley, down in Stockton, California, down Delano, Salinas, those were like first, second generation Filipinos who worked on farms and they understood the recruiters went down there specifically to, uh, to recruit them for the canneries. And, uh, and they, were, they were willing to, to come and do the work. And so that they had really a pipeline to all those workers specifically down in those communities. And the community that we talk about, the Filipinos communities, and in Wapato, we had one of the oldest community buildings that was erected in the United States. And so that these communities played an integral part in the, uh, the livelihood of, you know, not only canning workers, but the farmers, because they were, you know, they were certainly a part of that. And especially like in Seattle, where the community really worked hand in hand with the, with the, with the union that, because it was based in Seattle. And so my experience working in Alaska allowed me the opportunity to really be, uh, be, be part of that experience working in Alaska side by side with some of these old monongs who are still working up there, you know, working, they were, you know, they mainly started back in the, back in the thirties. And uh, some of them just continued to go up there and go up there. And so I had an opportunity to work with some of the older gentlemen, older uh, workers, and uh, they shared their stories. We, we work and eat and live together. And uh, they were able to share their stories. And I just listened intently to what they had to say. And it was that historical connection that I found very interesting, which allowed me during my tenure being executive officer in the union to understand what they went through. Next slide, please. Next, thank you. So the uh, image on the left-hand side is the, is the uh, Union Hall there on uh, those of you from Seattle on the 2nd and Main. And uh, that is an old picture back, uh, you know, taken 1944. And after that, the, uh, the building had, uh, had, had uh, fire in it. And so it was the, the top floor was demolished but they were able to uh, keep the first and second floor. And so that building is there down in Pioneer Square. It doesn't look anything like it now because it, what building was condemned. There's a lot of plywood on there and rather graffiti on it, but uh, you know, the, the, the building is still there. So I will talk about uh, my, my presentation will talk of the timeline between the original beginnings of the union from 1933 to 1960, and what the formation of the union, uh, the organization meant at that time. I will talk about the uh, organized labor and the political influence it had on the direction of which, where the union was going. And I will uh, talk about the union officials that took office as president during that period. Uh, there's a significant, significant part of the union's history, which I will devote to uh, the U.S. government policies, primarily uh, focusing on uh, Ernesto Manhattan. And then at last, I will talk to talk about uh, our union's favorite son, Carlos Bolasan. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the genesis of the union started in 1933, and the name of the first president was Virgil Dayongan. And he was the principal officer, but he also relied on a gentleman by the name of Conrad Espy. Conrad Espy was a 27-year-old Norwegian who President Dayongan figured that in order to fight the white man in negotiations at the employer, that he needed, the, he needed the white man to, to come in and assist him. And so he was a strategically a great organizer and, and from the get was able to uh, assist and, and, and uh, the president and continue on after uh, you know, the tragic uh, assassination of him, which happened uh, as I'll get into that happened uh, later in his term. But in 1935, the union was chartered under the AFL-CIO, the National 
labor organization. And uh, the union was uh, the County Workers Farm Laborers Union 18257. And during that period, they had uh, organized uh, 600 members. And that was a good number of members going up to the cannery at that time, originally at that time. And so, uh, you know, they're proud, just getting started. But unfortunately, in 1936, Dayungan and Aurelio Simeon, who was the secretary at that time, was assassinated in a restaurant there in the International District in uh, Chinatown. And he supposedly the assassin was a nephew of a labor contractor. And during that, during the, the during that uh, assassination, that uh, Simeon or Diogan was able to return fire and kill his assailant. And how ironic on the on the poster there to the left, that was to reelect. That was a, a campaign poster for uh, pre uh, President Diogan that the caption on top retain a fearless president. Well, he proved that by killing his assassin and uh, during when, and, and as he died, he was able to return fire and, 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 uh, and killed his assassin uh, during that period. So uh, that is uh, just one of the dark moments in our history. Next slide, please. The image on the left is a credential of uh, our shop steward. Once the shop steward, he would, they called them really a, a union delegate, would, uh, would have to take that up to the company or the plant, the cannery, and they would be recognized as a union delegate. And uh, it shows there, there's a little stamp there that says canceled. And uh, that cancellation, I believe I could read, can't read the writing, but I was able to read the writing. Apparently this person became a foreman and because uh, he became foreman, he was not eligible to become a rep union rep. And so, uh, and so that, uh, you know, they had to elect someone else to be that, uh, be the reunion rep because of conflict of interest. And <clears throat> during that, uh, during the, the genesis of the organization, the, uh, the union began uh, in the American Federation of Labor. And those of you who know a little bit about labor history, the AFL uh, was a was a more of a craft union, and uh, you know these were workers who were minorities and were unskilled laborers. And so, after a period of time, and Conrad Espy, who was the uh, you know who was the organizer and one of the keys founders of the organization, thought that they were not getting a fair shake within the AFL, and so. It took a period of time before they were able to uh, able to move, and so that they were disgruntled because they weren't they they weren't being uh, treated fairly. And during a period during that period, they you know sought to get out of the get out of the AFL, but they were chartered at that time. So, in order for them to you know continue on, they you know they knew strategically that they had to build capacity, and by building capacity, not only that they have Filipino workers, but they also had Japanese workers. And as you go through the, the, the history, chronologic history of the Kanye workers, it first started out with Chinese workers coming out until the Exclusionary Act at the uh, turn of the century, which didn't allow Chinese to be, as many Chinese to be working in the industry. And then what happened, the, the, the Japanese workers came up until they were excluded in the mid twenties of the Japanese Exclusion Act. And then the Filipinos came in during that time. And so, but during that period of time, you know, they were able to, they were able to uh, build an organization. But unfortunately during that period, there was a, the AFL-CIO, you know, had a strategic way in which they did not, they, you know, it, it's, it's a shame because they wanted to try to bust the union. They didn't really care for these workers. And so they wanted to, tr they tried to, this old way of work, you know, what they did was try to pit workers against workers. And they tried to force the, a split between the workers and they put the Japanese on as an organization on the right side against the Filipinos. And that didn't, what, so what happened there is they split. The AFL continued to uh, assist the Japanese workers and when the Filipinos left, they, they left and got into the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organization. And that's the, 
the evolution of what that what happened there. And when that happened, they had to change their name to the uh, to uh, Yukapawa, and it was a local seven of the uh, United Cannery Agricultural Packing House and Allied Workers of America Local Seven. And they can't, you know, they became a CIO affiliate. And so during that time, it was just like it was very difficult because the political environment was was incredibly right versus left, union against company. And then, uh, you know, uh, when I finish at the the latter, uh, my later slides was showing how the government intervened in uh, in the, in the union business uh, with. Uh, with holding, trying to hold the union accountable to a number of, uh, you know, their legal issues and policies. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the, the image on the left-hand side I put in there because I thought it was pretty cool. You know, these gentlemen sure knew how to dress and, uh, you know, they're pretty snazzy in terms of, uh, you know, they're, uh, you know, taking photos and some of these old photos are, are are great in terms of uh, you know how they dressed and, and how they carried themselves. So uh, as I mentioned, Virgil Dayongan was in leadership uh, from 1933 to 1936. Aurelio Cabatat, 1937 to 39, he took over after the assassination and uh, he actually continued on the policies of Dayongan and 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 really furthered the furthered the uh, you know, the efforts that Dainungan was, uh, was uh, pushing for. Uh, Vincent Nivia was from 1940 to 1942. It continued to be a left-leading organization during those, three, uh, during those three presidents. From 1943 to 1946, a gentleman by the name of uh, Trinidad Rojo. And I, uh, Trinidad was a very col colorful individual. I got to know him personally and uh, he would come into my office a number of times and he would discuss, give me like lectures. Uh, he was very, he was, uh, he was like, uh, uh, he claimed to be a, a professor and he even sounded like one because he would give me lectures on economics and, and history and, uh, and uh, you know, language. And he was, he was very articulate and I really enjoyed him, but he is more of a, a right leaning individual. Uh, Prudential Mori, uh, didn't really know him very well and haven't read much about him. Uh, Chris Mansalvis, who was uh, from 1949 to 1959, his son, Chris Mansalvis Jr., I've known for over 40 years and actually stays in my home uh, every year for the last 40 years because he resides in Mexico. And when he comes up to Seattle, he stays with me. Um, Canary leadership was actually bound to a fraternal organization during that period with the Caballeros de Masalan. They're a uh, Masonic organization. And during the war, the number of those, a number of the leadership in the union and on the executive board were members of the uh, de Masalan Lodge. And there was a falling out because after the war, a number of the soldiers who, uh, workers and the soldiers that returned who they, you know, they enlisted to fight the war for the United States, my, my father, was also one of them who joined the U.S. Army and fought in the war. But when they came back, the Union was more of a more, more of a conservative right-wing organization, and that's when uh, Monsalves came in and changed that whole dynamic. As I said, the Filipino community of Seattle was part of the organization because uh, you know number of the number of the presidents of the of uh, the Union were also presidents of the community. And so that was uh, something that you couldn't get away from. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, these two images here, one is of uh, the uh, union has uh, these, these uh, images here of uh, Ernesto Mangawan on the left. And there's a poster of uh, the union when uh, you know a lot of this was happening regarding the uh, intervention of the uh, United States government. Ernesto Malawan, I consider a, a, a hero of mine and the unions. He was able to, he was an individual who was the business agent. He was actually the president of the local 
in Portland, local 266. And when they merged from uh, local five in San Francisco and local 266, they merged into uh, local 37. A Mangawan came up to Seattle to become the business agent. And uh, there was an attack on him and the union during that period in 1950, where they were, they were trying to uh, discredit them and deport a number of these union officials because of the Tidy McDuffie and McLaren Act, because of uh, their personal, uh, they had uh, become associated with the uh, Communist Party. And so what happened during a four year period from 1949 to 1953, the deportation was you know, hanging over uh, Mangawan and all these other uh, supposedly uh, communists, including the president of the ILWU, Harry Bridges, and they were not successful. And if they were, with, and especially in the Mangawan case, that there were approximately 70,000 people or Filipinos who were waiting to see the outcome of that, uh, of the suit, because uh, they were about ready to be retorted too, if they, the United States government was successful in, in uh, finding Mangawan guilty uh, of his, but then what happened was because of a, uh, they, 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 they took it to the Ninth uh, Circuit Court and uh, they were found that uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't get to him. And, uh, and so they were able to, he was able to stay in the country. And so as well as uh, Monsalvis and Bridges, they, they fought a, a good fight. And you know, at that time, I didn't live necessarily, live through that time of red baiting, but he was able to survive those attacks. Uh, Ernesto, uh, I knew his wife, BJ, she was a good friend of mine. Uh, she was the head of the CP here in Seattle. In fact, uh, when she passed, I was uh, I spoke at her memorial, and they were they were uh, they were really pro uh, progressive. And Ernesto, uh, we owe him a great deal of debt for what he sacrificed and what he did for the union. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So, in wrapping this up. They, uh, the late, those of you, I don't know whether you're familiar with Carlos Bullison. Uh, that is Carlos Bullison there on the left. And uh, on the right is the sameness photo of myself. And uh, that photo was taken uh, in 2019. My wife and I were touring France and we're heading out to uh, Normandy. And we happened to stop at a uh, at the American World War II Museum in Cannes, France. It's a, quite a experience there. And as we were walk, as I was walking out, I noticed that they were having a, another exhibit, a separate exhibit of Norman Rockwell paintings. So uh, we, we paid to go uh, see that. And lo and behold, there was a, uh, the original painting of the, of the Four Wants. And those of you who are not familiar with the four wants that uh, FDR, Rose, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had commissioned uh, four, four, four folks to write essays in regards to the freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedoms of want, and the freedoms of fear. And Carlos Bullison had written this particular one, which is iconic with the uh, people sitting down at Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, it, uh, you know, it, it's uh, something that we're very proud of, of what he did back in 1943. I believe it was uh, March 6, 1943 that it was published. And also uh, Carlos Bullison wrote this literary classic. I don't know whether you can see it here. America's in the heart that, uh, you know, that it's, uh, it's, been used in college, uh, uh, law schools, and 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 things, and it's uh, very dear to my heart in terms of you know the meaning of uh, you know his writings, and also what is all, what he also had done is he was the editor of the 1952 yearbook, and uh, and so uh, this is a great this is a you know a great piece specifically because 
it was uh, taken in during that real, the trials and tribulations of that era. And so I would like to uh, close by just reading a uh, editorial part in the, uh, in the beginning of the yearbook. So it reads, we believe that the fundamental priorities of our union are the continuation of the democratic spirit in America and that they are the mainsprings of a society whose vital objectives could be channeled towards the collective interest and welfare of the whole people. A society, we must repeat, where war is eliminated, unemployment vanquished, profiteering, a legend of the ledgers of predatory animals and peace, a reality transcended into every human endeavor and the accompanying crescendo of triumphant democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Our next speaker is Reynaldo Pasqua, who is passionate about his place in Filipino American history. Uh, the child of working class immigrants, he counts historical preservation, education, and leadership as life achievements. Ray has a master's in public administration, served as a child welfare manager, and championed the passage of Washington State Bill 5865, which made October Filipino American History Month. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. To be there, uh, you, okay. Um, I'm uh, very happy to be here, um, and uh, I want to pay homage to uh, Richard's um, short um, but very detailed presentation. This is uh, our Filipino hall in Wapato. It was built in 1952. And it is the oldest and the first Filipino American hall in the United States that was built from the ground up. Um, my, uh, my story tonight is going to be um, very quick and it's gonna be telling you about um, the United Farm Workers and my participation with that uh, organization and um, my respect for the Filipino leaders who were uh, vice presidents of um, the United Farm Workers. Let's go to the next uh, um, uh, scene, please. Um, first of all, um, I'm gonna urge people to do research on this. Uh, this is a, uh, yeah, the, the movement is preserved by, um, popular media, and there are books on the, um, the leaders of the, the farm workers. They uh, did some autobiographical uh, books themselves. Um, the, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting uh, that Richard took us through the history of uh, the, the Cannery Workers Union Local 37, which was also uh, again, uh, also a farm workers union. The, um, I wanted to point out the book here that's, uh, that you can see. That has a history of the, the, the cannery industry in the Pacific Northwest. And actually there were uh, canneries along the Columbia River um, that were started by Eastern Europeans. So that book is called um, Maramin, Maramina Trabajo, or, uh, or the dirty, dirty Work. And it's done by a Filipino author. His name, his name is Donald Guamandar. And it, it is available. And that'll give you a rich history of the Pacific Northwest uh, salmon uh, canning industry. Um, the other uh, things in this collage of the movement that's preserved are uh, a sticker there of um, uh, Agbayani Village, uh, the book Journey to Justice, and uh, a book on the bottom there that's called 
uh, the, the story of Stockton, uh, California and, and the Filipino community there. Um, there are various books up and down the Pacific coast of the United States about the, the different Filipino American communities and people can uh, find out about those communities uh, by looking at those books. Next uh, archive, please, or next, uh, next screen. I'm going to talk about 1971 um, because that in my mind was a very critical year for the United Farm Workers. Um, when I, I, I had the honor to attend the 19, uh, no, the 2015 uh, celebration in Washington, DC. It was the first uh, presidential celebration of Filipino American History Month. October is Filipino American History Month because the first Filipino to set foot in the United States did so on October 18th, um, 1587, and that was in San Diego, San Diego, California, the, um, and um, that was off of a, a Spanish galleon ship. But October is uh, recognized as Filipino American History Month. Now, President Obama invited activists and leaders from throughout the United States, and we attended the uh, the first recognition of Filipino American History Month at the White House. And in his uh, message to the attendees, President Obama named three uh, significant contributions of Filipinos. The first one, our um, participation in World War II, 75, and now uh, 81 years ago. The second um, important history, historical fact that o Obama brought forth was the um, contributions of Filipino farm workers in leading the great boycott that, that happened in um, 1965, 1965. So um, I am, um, focusing on 1971 here uh, because things really uh, happened in that month, in, in that year. Um, and it was uh, also a, an important part of my, um, my progression as a, as a person and as a uh, individual and as a Filipino American. I had gone to Alaska. I had worked in Alaskan salmon canneries uh, for five years, starting in 1965. But in 1971, something more important uh, uh, came up, and that was my search for, uh, for meaning as a Filipino American. And I had heard about this uh, Farm Workers Union, and 1971 happened to be the first year that the union had uh, had in terms of uh, implementing the contracts that they had with the uh, uh, grape growers in Delano, California. Remember that the 1965 uh, strike action uh, when the um, AWOC, the uh, Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, which was the AFL-CIO uh, union led by uh, Larry Itliang, uh, joined with the uh, National Farm Workers Union led by Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. So 1965 was the, um, the year that was called the, the Great Grape Strike. That's, that started it. Uh, it took five years of picketing and uh, uh, work stoppages and uh, legal, legal challenges for the United Farm Workers to uh, win the battle. And, and so in 1970, the uh, United Farm Workers, uh, the, which was the uh, uh, new name for the two organizations, um, 
won the battle and they, they signed the contracts with 18 uh, uh, grape growers in the Delano area. Um, so in 71, I, I could not go to Alaska. I, I had to go and I had, uh, during the winter of 1970, I had uh, gone to Delano, California. I had met um, the, the de facto Filipino leader, Larry Itliong. We became um, great allies with each other. And um, I participated in, um, well, the activities that were happening at that time were uh, grape and wine, uh, table wine boycotts and um, the uh, uh, activities of uh, striking and, um, uh, and especially the, uh, the uh, unique leadership of Cesar Chavez, who, as you know, um, took on the, uh, the aura of uh, fasting and, and, um, and other uh, nonviolent activities to uh, bring the uh, focus of the, the, the country and the world to the United Farm Workers. 1970, that's when the contract was signed. And in 19, so in 1971, during um, the summer, I, I, I traveled uh, south from uh, Washington state to join, uh, quote unquote, the movement. Um, in the um, picture here, you could see uh, the story about McCall. Well, one of the, the first stops that I attended was uh, Salem, Oregon. And it was uh, the United Farm Workers were protesting a law that had been passed by the Oregon legislature uh, calling for um, a right to work law, which meant in, in agriculture. So that meant that if uh, farm workers, uh, which you strike as a main source of winning battles with farmers, uh, if they struck, they, they could not strike. Uh, and and uh, farm workers, would have the right to work. And, uh, and so the, the, the legislature passed that bill and we, we fought it and uh, Governor McCall vetoed that law. Uh, I then traveled down to California and um, I attended, uh, if, next, next shot please. Um, I attended um, to work. And I was, uh, I worked uh, in Lamont, California and, ba and in Bakersfield, California. And I was a, a volunteer organizer for the United Farm Workers. And because of the, uh, the contract that, that had been signed, my responsibility was to um, oversee the, uh, the workers on the Gamara, uh, uh, grape, uh, grape farm. And um, this, this shot shows Marissa Arroy. Uh, she's in the middle there. Um, and on, to her left uh, in the white uh, shirt is uh, Dr. Pio Decano. Um, Marissa is, was the producer of the, the, the Delano Monongs, which, which tells the story of the um, the the um, the fight in Delano uh, with the with the grape growers. Um, a sidelight about Pio Decano, the man there, is, is that his father was the uh, uh, litigant, the the Filipino American who won the rights for Filipinos in Washington State to lease and to buy uh, property here in Washington State. He brought a case to the Washington State Supreme Court, which, um, which, uh, which, which was ultimately successful. And in 1941, Filipinos uh, won the right to lease and uh, purchase property here in Washington State. Next uh, picture, please. Um, Don Mabalon's triumph. Uh, I have a, uh, uh, the poster of her in this uh, photo because Don was a um, professor 
at the San Francisco State University. Uh, and she did the first um, children's book, or she did the first book on uh, Mr. Lariat Leong. Um, Lariat Leong being the uh, vice president to uh, Cesar Chavez. When the two unions merged, um, because the Hispanics, the Mexican Americans had uh, uh, something like 4,000, 5,000 uh, 5, workers, um, and then the, the Filipinos had 1,500, 1,500 to 2,000 in the Delano area. Um, by by uh, sheer numbers, the Mexican American um, uh, decision or the decision was to have Cesar Chavez be the director of the Farm Workers Union and Larry Itlong, Larry Itliang be the um, vice uh, vice president. Uh, Don Mabalon, after five years of research, uh, um, published a um, children's book on uh, Larry Itliang. Uh, it came out in the fall of uh, the year 2018. And, and the tragedy about uh, Don uh, was that she passed away uh, in a uh, accident um, uh, in, in the in the summer of, of 2018. And so we, we are still mourning her. And, um, you know, she was quite a historian. Her, uh, her second uh, most famous book is called um, uh, Filipino American is in the heart, uh, the story of Stockton and the Filipino American community there in Stockton. F uh, Stockton is probably the um, capital of Filipino American uh, community uh, in uh, the United States. Next uh, scene, please. Um, the It Leong letters. And uh, uh, this is important. Um, at the forefront of this uh, scene is uh, the book that uh, Don Mabulan wrote and has, which has come out uh, published in 2018. The um, It Leong letters are a series of letters that um, Larry and I wrote to each other. Well, actually, I have uh, I have 15 letters from Larry that were written from the period of 1970, uh, November 1970, to um, uh, October of uh, 1971, and then we got one later posthumously. I got one later posthumously. Um, these letters uh, are a um, a start of a book which will tell the story of um, Larry's philosophies, his history, his um, his uh, lust for life, and uh, uh, you know uh, Richard. I, I wanted to also tell he, uh, him that uh, I, I, I was able to reintroduce uh, Mr. It Leong to the Pacific Northwest starting in 1971. I was able to through my uh, activities, I able to bring him back to Washington State. And his first um, uh, question when he came off the plane was, how some, um, I wanna see PJ. So he always kept that contact uh, with uh, PJ Mangawang. And I, I do believe that uh, Ernesto was, was truly one of his uh, most important um, uh, mentors. Next uh, scene, please. Uh, I received my uh, COVID. I um, I am so happy so uh, that I can be uh, around my two uh, grandchildren, uh, Gabriella and Natalia. I love them both, um, and so I think we're ready to uh, uh, bring uh, Richard and I together, and we could answer some more questions if there are any for, from the audience. Uh, I thank Mohai uh, for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. We do have some questions. Um, so I guess I'll start with um, one of them was from the beginning talking about the difference between the AFL um, and the CIO. And the question is, um, did the AFL see the cannery workers as unskilled? Um, 
and uh, the person was asking that cannery work does require a significant skill and wondering if that categorization as unskilled was because of racism. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was all of the above. Essentially that uh, the leader of the FL at that time was a gentleman, was a guy named Samuel Gompers. And those of you who are familiar with Sam, Samuel Gompers, he was really anti-Asian because he had read, wrote some books about how the Chinese at the time when there were railroad workers that were taking away jobs from, uh, from the American workers. And that, uh, you know, that, you know, to me at that time showed really what the, what the organization was about. And given there's a lot of history behind what the AFL had done, not done for the, for the uh, cannery workers at that time, especially when they started pitting workers against workers and trying to strike the wedge between the, the, the nationalities between the Filipinos and Japanese. So we, they didn't really care, but they, we needed to have start out by getting a charter from someone. So it was the AFL at that time that, uh, that took us in, but they didn't really do us any favors. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, I think. Uh, let me of, uh, let me. Uh, oh, can yeah. I, I add one thing. Let me. Uh, when I visit, when we visited Larry Itliang's home after he had passed away, he passed away in February of uh, 1977, and my family were able to attend. Uh, you know, just to visit his family after that. Um, this is a this is a uh, a farm workers' bill of rights that was done by the American, um, the Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations for farm workers. And this was a, a listing of principles and it was done in April of 1959, 1959. And I, I just wanted to read this because it, I think it try, does try to um, address the issue about race. Article five, our union will insist on equal rights at all times for all agricultural workers, regardless of race, culture, language, religion, sex, age, or citizenship. So maybe back then they were beginning to um, address that. And this, as I said, well, it was uh, it was done on September 5, 1961. So um, I, I saw the a. a AFL-CIO as wanting to address that issue um, in that statement. Yeah, but Ray, during that time, they would merge between the AFL and CIO. But I was talking about just when the AFL was a standalone international. Yeah. Right? So the yeah. CIO was took those policies, and when they merged together, that's what they came out with. Okay. You got another questions? Yeah. Rachel? Um, another specific question was, were there any songs or uh, revolution chants spoken or sung during the Delano riots that were inherently Filipino? I, I think in the, um, the, 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 the mov movie or the uh, documentary that, uh, uh, Marissa Roy does. She 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 had um, pictures of the uh, the Filipinos picketing during um, the strike and everything like that. And one of the songs that they did sing was "The Hill Sayo," which started this this program tonight. Um, and so there was a you know uh, there was some uh, effort by the, the Filipinos to bring you know their their cultural culture into it um but it was overwhelmingly a, a mexican uh you know union at, at at that point when when they did merge right thank you um another question more broadly about the union in general uh both all the unions is how how many filipino americans were involved and were they mostly single uh, and younger or did they have families um, as well? Um, I think the question is, were they mostly like younger, younger single folk or um, did it, was there more of an age range of who was involved in the unions? 
Well, I guess the period when the cannery workers started back in the 30s, those guys were pretty young at the time. They were probably in their 20s. And, uh, and so they were all single. There was hardly any Filipina ladies who uh, were in the United States at that time. So most of them were single and they had opportunities to migrate from the Central Valley in California up to Alaska to do these jobs. And so the, uh, the, that was the tradition of them starting out then, you know, down in Delano, California, cutting asparagus in the spring and then moving to Alaska in the summer to do the jobs there coming back to California and doing the pruning, you know, in the, in the grapes and all in the orchards. And so by the time the movement of the farm workers came about, you know, they were, uh, you know, they were somewhat getting established in as far as their probably middle age and they were able to marry at that time. But the m number of people, number of these workers, when they mm -hmm. got started were uh, young, they were young 20 year old, 30 year old uh, uh, cannery workers, uh, which were mostly single. Yeah, that I, was, I, oh, sorry, keep going. Yeah. No, I would, I would say from the, the period of 1905, 1910, when um, the United States gained control of the Philippines, um, you saw a phenomenon, and that was uh, 90 to 95 percent of the Filipinos coming to the United States were men, were men. And, and there, there's, there were, Dor Dorothy Cordova points to two factors that were important. Number one, um, the, the Catholic religion, the Catholic religion, which most Filipinos were, were um, they 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 did not um, they did not uh, favor women traveling alone, and mm -hmm. so if if a woman traveled, she had to have a chaperone, which would have been another woman, <laughs> and so and then in our generate in in that generation also there was a, a cutback in U.S. immigration, so that. Uh, you know, beginning in uh, 18, nine, uh, 18, uh, late, eight, late 1880s, the, the, the um, uh, 1880 what, what the, the quota was, uh, was only 50 Filipinos per, 50 people per year from each country. But because the United States was a, a US territory, um, Filipinos could come over here uh, all they needed was the passage for the boat that they came over in, and so Andy Umutan, who was the uh, who who was the uh, uh, also a vice president in the union, he calls that that generation of Filipinos who came from 1920, let's say, until 1965 as the lost generation because they 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 didn't come over here with women. Um, they, they were single male males, uh, and there were anti-miscegenation laws, which uh, did not, which did not allow marriage to other races, and so um, they were very lonely. That's what. That's why the um, the the creation of a, a retirement village for the retired Filipino farm workers was such a big. Uh, big uh, goal for the Filipino vice presidents of the union. That makes sense. Following up uh, with that, uh, somebody was asking about the exclusionary acts restricting Chinese workers and later Japanese workers and wondering if there were efforts to prevent similar legislation. I think you were starting to get that that was different because um, of the territorial status of the Philippines at that time. Well, well, basically, the, the, the Japanese took over the Chinese after the Chinese Exclusion Act of, um, of uh, 1848. And then the Japanese started coming in and then uh, uh, Japan's uh, world uh, view uh, was not very popular. And, and, and then basically, so basically, and then the Philippines became a U.S. territory. And so beginning in the 1900s, Filipinos took over for Japanese in terms of being the, uh, the uh, uh, laborer of, of choice. And there was a progression also. They started out uh, going to Hawaii. It was, first it was Chinese and, and there were other races, but then the Japanese uh, uh, took over for the Chinese and then, um, and then the Filipinos began um, uh, 
uh, supplanting the, the Japanese workers in, in Hawaii. So that now the, the biggest uh, uh, Asian population in Hawaii is Filipino American. Someone was asking if there was a union connection um, with plantations in Hawaii and was there any work between unions like solidarity work to unionize those plantations and be in contact with the unions out here? Rich, not, you, go, you have you yeah, that? Yeah, not to my knowledge. I mean, I, my grandfather actually worked as a cicada down at the turn of the century and was uh, was imported from the Philippines to work in the cane fields in, in Hawaii. On the, I believe it was on the Big Island. He returned back home to the Philippines and my grandmother didn't want to go back to Hawaii. So he didn't, never returned. I know that the ILWU uh, Local 142 in Hawaii was, uh, was active uh, early on, but not that early in terms of organizing those workers. I know that uh, part of the uh, history that I, I'm aware of is that the, the predominant workers during that time were the Japanese, and the Japanese were the ones who really took over, or took uh, as far as the uh, the workforce. The Filipinos were the manual laborers, and the Japanese were the ones who were were like the foremans and uh, you know some of the contract people out there. But as far as organizing, cross organizing between the mainland and Hawaii, outside of uh, local 142 in Hawaii, mm -hmm. if there was an agricultural or union out there. I don't know of, of any. Did you have something you wanted to add, Ray? Oh, I, I, I just read recently that um, the most uh, successful uh, actions of the, um, the agricultural workers union in Hawaii was relatively recent. Like um, their success, their biggest success came in 1948. Isn't that your understanding, Richard? Uh, yeah, it was around that period. Yeah. Yeah, around 1948. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't at the beginning in the, in the 20s or even before that. I don't think that they were. You know, they weren't organized back then during that early in the period. But yeah, somewhere in that period in the 40s and 50s, they were. Someone had a question about books. First of all, um, there was a question about the documentary that you mentioned, Ray. Um, yes. What was, what was the name of that? Well, the, the documentary is named Delano Monongs. The Delano Monongs, uh, D-E-L-A-N-O, and then M-A-N-O-N-G-S. And the producer is uh, Marissa, M-A-R-I-S-S-A, -S Arroy, A-R-O-Y. And so um, it's, uh, it's, it's available. And, and uh, so that's, uh, that's only a great um, uh, remembrance of the, the Delano uh, uh, strike that, that's around right now. Wonderful. Um Somebody uh, had asked about the book Alascaro Memories by Robert Francis Floor and Remembering Silme Domingo and Jean Viernes uh, by Ron Chu and um, wanted to know if you had heard of them. And then also I want to expand that to ask if you have any other books that you recommend people read if they want to learn more. Uh, well, there's so many books out there. I did send you a link about the last book that was written by Professor Ma, uh, Michael McCann, and maybe you could post that up later on. It was just released, I think, by University of Chicago Press uh, this February. It's, uh, he talks about the history of the union. Uh, this is the book that you're talking about with Ron Chu, Remembering Somi Domingo and Jean Viernes. Uh, it does have... Uh, you know, a number of us uh, giving testimonials about uh, working with Gene and working with Somi, but that's a, another era that I didn't touch on. And uh, also, uh, if people were interested, that other link that I sent you was uh, the University of Washington, uh, Seattle Civil, Civil Rights and a Northwest History Project, which is, uh, there's a number of, uh, there's a number of, uh, of uh, essays, papers, and, uh, and uh, videos of, uh, of uh, reviews 
of uh, the all those issues. And also I do have a or, uh, oral presentation in those. So it does give a number of different people who have worked in Alaska and gives their personal experience working in the Alaska canneries. And I'll put that, I'll send that back out to you, Rachel, if you want to go oh, ahead great. and post that later. Yeah. Ray, did you have any book recommendations? Well, I, I, this, this, this area is, is, uh, is, it's almost like a, um, uh, beginning, uh, f you know, for, uh, for scholars and researchers to, to get into because it hasn't been, uh, thought of, uh, by the way, let me give you, let me give the world some good news also. Um, George Floyd's, uh, murder was uh, is going to be convicted i'm very happy about that but um there is a a, a man whose name is rob bonta b-o-n-t-a and he is a member of the uh, um, california state assembly he's the only filipino american uh member of the uh, california assembly and the governor of how of uh, california just appointed him um as a the new attorney general for the state of California. Rob Bonta has farm worker roots and his mother and father, um, they worked uh, with Cesar Chavez at uh, Keene, California, La Paz, which is the, the headquarters of the United Farm Workers. But Rob Bonta's first um, action when he, he became an assembly member in uh, 2013, in 2014, he uh, he got the, the birth date of Larry It Leong recognized as a state a holiday in the state of California. Um, and why, why I, what's more important is that the next year he, um, he got an appropriation, appropriation, a $73,000 legislative appropriation so that whenever any um, books about the contributions of Filipino farm workers is written and it's in the curriculum for the state of California um, that Filipinos had to be uh, recognized also. So hopefully those resources will begin coming out. Um, uh, Philip Veracruz uh, has an autobiography. He was also a, a farm workers uh, vice president. Um, and then there's a young, uh, a lady named Dolores Huerta, no, Dol Dolores um, Velasco. And she was the wife of Pete, Pete, Pete Velasco, one of the uh, vice presidents of the union also. And she has done several poems. And if we had enough time, I would read one. Well, can I read it? Sure. I think we okay. have enough time. Maybe we can end All on right. a poem. Okay, this is called, where did I put it? Oh. We read on a poem. Here it is. Paolo, P-A-O-L-O, Paolo Agbayani was a farm worker. He was an elderly farm worker and he died of a uh, heart attack while on strike, while picketing uh, uh, um, during the, the farm strike. So this is called Agbayani. You called them your brothers, the Manongs of old. You embraced their lives and hearts to ward off the cold, the cold of indifference, the cold of neglect, the cold of abuse. For them, you had a village built, loving hearts and hands from north, south, east, and west. They came, the volunteers who built the village of love, with love, Agbayani by name. It was here you wished the Filipino brothers to remain in peace and con contentment, a place to call the home after, after too many years of living alone, thanks to the law of this land, but you will always be their brother, their friend. <laughs> and so the final, line is Mabuhai, Brother Caesar. So that's that was by Dolores and Velasco. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
I think that's a great way to end. I know we do have some more questions, but I think unfortunately we're coming to the end of our time tonight. Um, and it's, it seems obvious to me we're going to have to do um, more programs on this subject because there's, this is just the surface of what we could cover. So thank you so much, um, Richard and Ray. We're really happy to have you. Um, and uh, for all of you out there, we will be recording this, so don't worry, there will be a chance to rewatch um, any parts that you missed and to tell all your friends and family. Um, and then I also wanted to give a shout out to uh, our uh, program next month for History Cafe. Again, it's the third Wednesday of every month, and so it's going to be May 19th. Um, and we're going to have Charlie Rains, who will be talking about uh, the checkerboard landscape of the Northwest and the ways that the railroads influenced um, our land use um, and uh, the way land has been preserved and the projects that um, the Sierra Club is doing right now around that. Um, he'll tell you much more about that next month, so please come back. And um, we also, we love to hear what you think about our program. So we're going to put a link in the chat um, that is for a survey so that you can tell us what you liked, uh, what you'd like to see improved, thoughts you have for programs in the future. So please take a moment to fill that out. Um, and then also we ask that if you learned something new or enjoy the work we do, uh, please consider making a gift and becoming a member to support future programs and help sustain the museum beyond the impact of uh, the pandemic closure. Although I am happy to say we are open again. Um, we'll maybe put a link in the chat to where you can get tickets to come see us. But again, um, we're looking forward to when we can do History Cafe in person too. Um, so as you exit uh, and go back to the rest of your lovely evening, um, I can't believe the sun is still out. Happy spring, everyone. Uh, please have a lovely evening. Stay safe, stay healthy, and um, we hope to see you next month. So thank you. And thank you again so much to our speakers and to our wonderful partners at HistoryLink. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>